Do you like change? No. <laughs> that was quick. You don't like change? Uh-uh. Okay. Welcome back to In Residence. I'm Keith. And I'm Laura. Hey, Laura. Hey, Keith. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing swell. What's going on? This week, I had a trip to Madison for work. Our meeting was at a really beautiful location, the Ar- Arboretum. And one of the things that was going on there was the butterfly exhibit. They've let all these butterflies go. They're flying around all these beautiful trees and beautiful flowers. But whenever I think about butterflies, I think about metamorphosis. I think about change. One of my favorite memories growing up was finding a monarch caterpillar on some milkweed, you know, capturing it (laughs) and putting it in a very large jar with holes in the top and milkweed and sticks for it to climb and watching as that went from caterpillar to cocoon to beautiful butterfly and then we could release it. So I've been thinking a lot about the stages of change or change. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, because the caterpillars are on milkweed right now. Okay. So I'm always checking the milkweed to see, ooh, is there one? Can we bring it in? And the boys can watch that change take place before our eyes over a matter of days. I've been thinking about change and what that's like. And I thought maybe we could talk about it. All right. Sounds good. I actually enjoy change, but sometimes it's hard to decide, okay, I'm, I'm going to change or I'm going to be good with change. That's not in my control. Maybe I'll give you an example. Another reason why I'm thinking about this right now at work I had kind of a big announcement in a leadership change in our organizational structure. It surprised me. And I, you know, I went through kind of those, oh, I don't know if I want that to change. In fact, I know I don't want it to change, but I knew it's going to change whether I'm ready for it or not. How do I work through that change? How do we work through change? How can you do that? So when you've, come up against a a time when change was put upon you. It wasn't something that you sought out to change, but something like, hey, hey, Keith, here's something that's going to change. And your move, how have you come upon change and how have you worked through change or not worked through change? In the past, more often than not, I'd probably begrudgingly moved forward through change, uh, I'm more likely to maybe cocoon. Okay. I can see how I, I, I am resistant to change and that's not unusual, but I want that to be different. And I've worked towards being different and trying to accept that that flow is going to continue and can't remember exactly where I heard it. But the question that comes to my head is, does the caterpillar know that it's going to change? When it's going through that metamorphosis. Mm. Like, like interesting. Because we don't always know when the change is coming. But change is coming. <laughs> it's going to happen. Maybe don't spend so much energy resisting. Say maybe a process is getting changed at work. Yeah. I can feel myself instantly saying why. Pushing back. Like <laughs> why would you change? That's different. I know how to do it this way. Sure. But I don't want to be that person. A, a healthy dose of that is great. You know like let's. Let's double check that we're not changing something simply to change it. And let's get people's opinion and say, you know, we're thinking of trying this because we think it'll be more efficient or it'll save you more time and you can work over here. I understand that that's probably why most changes are happening in workplaces is like, how can we make things better? But when it's ha- the, the change affects you and you maybe weren't given the information to process it beforehand. <laughs> It can feel very sudden. Mm-hmm. And I think those defense mechanisms kick in. And for me, it is to be somewhat standoffish and skeptical in the past, for sure. I haven't had to deal with that for a while, except for with within myself. And I have to ask myself, dude, why are you being so standoffish? Push forward. You need to make some change here in order to grow, mm-hmm. right? In order to get your wings yeah. kind of thing. So. Yeah, I... um so your reaction is somewhat kind of to push back against it a little bit. And not even actively. It's in my head. 
Okay. Like I wouldn't actively say to like to my boss, like, well, that's a dumb idea. Why would we do that? <laughs> but I might be thinking that. Okay. Be, my, my initial reaction is why are you changing this? This is what I know. It may not be perfect, but I know what to do in all these steps. And now, we, now we have to do a new process. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, what if I mess that up? You know, <laughs> like that's, I think where I could, yeah. I could get kind of tripped up. Um, I don't want to be like that. I can recognize that the reason I'm talking about is because I've recognized it. I think the hardest part is when you're working with somebody that doesn't even recognize that you're just being anti and you don't understand that you are. You're not, I'm not talking about like actively sabotaging something, but that's good. That's what I think people subconsciously sabotage new things because of this innate desire to not change. Sure. Because that uncertainty, the anxiety and the fear of the unknown is what's allowed us to continue. It's kept us safe, right? And so it's all that again. Yeah. Something I struggle with related to change has been having a relationship end because I, I know what to expect and how to work with or how to interact with certain people. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's that promise of, I know where I'm going. I know what the future looks like that we've co-developed in some way. One example that I'm thinking of, and this was completely out of everyone's control, but when I was pregnant with child one, I had a fantastic doctor. And when I got hmm, maybe within a couple months of my due date, she had to step away for a few months Mm -hmm. for personal things. That was really hard to accept that change, even though the doctor that I moved to was fantastic. Right. Mm -hmm. And I trusted a great deal. That was a really hard transition for me and that, that shift and that change. Was it the, because it just differed from what you were expecting? Yes. Right. And that, I think that's what happens so often with change. It's that, oh, that surprise versus delight. Because (laughs) if I'm delighted, yay for change. If I'm surprised, boo, I don't want any of that. Like, I think that's the subtle difference. Guess what? Tonight, instead of having chicken and beans, we're going to have buffalo wings. And I'd be like, yay. Like delight. (laughs) That's delightful. That's a good change. I think there's more growing with the change that we tend to associate with like, oh, that's bad change. That's hard change, right? Yeah. There's a reason I'm pushing back against it, but it doesn't mean it's a, a useful reason. All the time. So that Mm -hmm. signal, when I get it, I've learned to start to inspect why I'm reacting to things certain ways, especially when it's different than what I thought was going to happen. Okay, so what did I expect? Why is this different? How does that make me feel? You know, think just things like that and just learning how to ask myself questions versus letting how I feel about something working or not working. So I kind of steamroll my attitude and then I maybe react poorly. Mm -hmm. A strategy that I've learned around change, especially when your, your brain is telling you everything is changing. I don't want this or I'm uncomfortable with this. It might not be completely like I flat out want everything to stop. It might just be like, Ooh, this is uncomfortable. Yeah. And so you kind of like (laughs) slow down or withdraw a little bit. bit. Like when you start, when I start to notice that that's when I do a little more introspection and try to Notice like, okay, you're starting to do that thing that you do when you're not comfortable. Yeah. Let's think about this a little bit. Yeah. And the strategy I've learned is that although things are changing or there is change, there are also things that are staying the same. And so to not over index on all the change, the unknown, the uncomfortableness, but to also say like, yes, you are going to have a new doctor deliver your baby. And you're still going to be delivering your baby with somebody that you trust. The same place. The same place with Keith by your side, you know? And so like there's, there's that sometimes you can think, well, everything's different. It's like, well, no. You catastrophize. (laughs) Right. Well, it's easy to do because there's so much unknown. Yeah. Well, it's easy to do until I think you maybe build the resilience, like the reps, is like the resilience comes from putting yourself through scenarios that build your ability 
to overcome the obstacles, right? Yeah. Definitely something I need to work on, I bet. Gotten better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? But, I mean, it's always a little easier with, with somebody else. Like, like your perspective on what maybe I'm spiraling about and vice versa, you know, me for you. It's always really helpful. It is because you can, well, we can ground each other and pull back from the spiral, right? And say, okay, I know that right now we're spiraling, but let's just take a deep breath and look at it from this way or that way that we're, we, you might not be seeing right now, but is this helpful? I think that's something you and I ask each other quite a bit. So I'm hearing this, but also, have you thought about this? Is that helpful? Yeah. You say that to me a lot. Is this helpful? Yeah. The only way I can describe that is shifting what you're focused on. If you can shift your perspective, right? If there's like another side to something, not necessarily trying to deconstruct what their motives are, why this or why that, but like, like, okay, they're, they're probably reacting for us for a reason. Right. And so am I, but why am I reacting the way I am? And it just kind of pulls yourself zooms out is what I'm trying to say. You just kind of zoom out or adjust your focus a little bit. It's something I'm trying to do refocusing in or out, shifting that perspective. That is a skill that I'm seeking to get better at so that when things come up and it's usually with like another party, like another actor, but it doesn't have to, I mean, it could be with myself, right? Like there's a lot of, a lot of thoughts going on up here (laughs) and knowing how to acknowledge it, but also call it out and be like, okay, you're, you're kind of just being lazy thinking this. Maybe there's some other things to it. Being able to come at it from different angles, it, that exercising my thoughts versus to me calling myself this like a little lazy or lackadaisical with how I'm going about interpreting maybe the input I'm getting. You mean the input from the world? The world? Yeah. I mean, if there's, if I'm interpreting some change and my first, my response is no. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of lazy, right? It's not very curious. You know, it's that standoffishness. It it there's no possibility there. And so allowing myself to be okay with instead of no, how about a maybe? Doesn't have to right. be a full yes. Okay, maybe that's interesting what's happening. Hmm, let me think about that. I'm not sure. How might I flip this around and and think about it or look at it from a different angle and then maybe no. <laughs> Yeah, I like that. At least giving yourself a little time and space to dig in and consider. Yeah, and you know, and that's a big thing too. How uncomfortable it is for some people, myself included, in certain situations, for there to be silence, for there to be space before a response or reaction is given. Because mm-hmm. it's like this nonstop go 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 world, right? Like, right, and so. Giving myself time to think, as well as allowing others, being patient. I guess that's come up a lot too, right? The patience. Yeah. And grace, like I always say. like You do. That's almost my word of the year. (laughs) Patience and grace. Yeah, yeah. That'll be next year for sure. There you go. (laughs) Yeah, that's huge. I've talked about balancing patience with ambition, right? Giving myself grace and making sure all these things that we talk about and come up with. But you just saying now allowing myself the time and space to think and consider something that maybe I would say no to. I haven't really thought of it that way. I'm thinking more of patience as it's okay. Just keep working. It'll come or it'll work eventually. Just keep going. Even though I don't want to be go, go, go. I'm kind of go, go, go. Even though I'm trying to say patience. (laughs) You are go, go, go. Yeah. I know you think you aren't. I don't. I feel so lazy all the time. But the speed at which you want things to be done sometimes is much more where it's like. It's unsustainable. It is where it's even a, we're just enjoying a, you know, yeah. meal prep for like supper for a family supper. You're like, chop this, do this. That You know, you're not, you're not bossy, but you're just, you have a speed in which you want to work. That's almost an impatient speed. Because you want it to be done. Yeah, because it was my work. It used to be my work. And in my head, I'm wanting to enjoy the process. Yeah. And you want the process to be completed. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. No, it's that's good for me to to remember and slow my roll. 
Yep. And enjoy. I think I even said to you today, like, this is just the journey. We're enjoying the journey. Oh, yeah. Gave you a huge eye roll at that, I think, too. <laughs> you did. It didn't help that we were in a car and I wasn't driving. That is true. <laughs> that is true. It's just not a, it's, it, I, it's something for me yes. to work on. <laughs> yes, yes. I want to talk a little bit more about managing change and managing transitions. I have a book that was recommended to me not that long ago, maybe five years ago or so. It's Managing Transitions, Making the Most of Change by William Bridges and Susan Bridges. The whole purpose of the book is to really help yourself and teams navigate that change process. The thing that I wanted to talk to you about is really the idea that there are three phases to transition or the process of change. The first phase is ending, losing, and letting go. What was it? Ending, losing, and letting go. So really letting go of old ways and old identity that people had. And this is the first phase of transition. It's really the ending of the time, the ending of your current state, or what you know as your current state. Yeah. Phase two is called the neutral zone. And so the neutral zone is really that in between when the old is gone and the new isn't fully up and running. It's kind of in between. And so you're realigning your Mm. uh, brain and yourself with letting go of the past, repattering, pattern, pattern, patterning. That's a hard word. Like pitter patter, but Pitter patter, pattering. So, do you want to say it? Repattering. Right? <laughs> Can you say it? The neutral zone is a time when you're repatterning. Yes, your brain, your habits, your expectations, right? And then the third phase is the new beginning phase. The new beginning phase is when you're coming out of the transition, really beginning that that new state. And this is when you start developing your new identity, you're experiencing new energy, you're discovering a new sense of purpose related to the change, and then you're starting to make that change work for you. So it's this process from the old into the new, but really it has to begin with that ending before you can start conceptualize, go through that metamorphosis. It's, I mean, I think that neutral zone is a lot like the caterpillar. You asked before, does the caterpillar know it's going to go through this change and become a butterfly? And I guess maybe my question to you, when you see change coming, do you know that you are going to go through this process? I think I'm a little more aware now Mm -hmm. that that neutral zone, that in between, Mm -hmm. we have been using that language when we're talking about our project. Yeah. And that going in between these different areas of our life and where they overlap that, that transition between them is where a lot of the hard work is done, where we're actively balancing because it's always in flux. Things are shifting. And so this aligns with that and how I've been thinking about it and recognizing and acknowledging that transitions are hard. That in itself, that awareness helps you transition Mm -hmm. because you can give it attention and you can support yourself or others that you're helping in their transitions. I like that what they're saying in this book is aligning with how you and I have been thinking as we've been developing ways to talk about setting ourselves up to have the best life. We've identified that the, the trickiest part and where people need support and where we need support from each other and our support systems are in those spaces between where we're not certain that it's A or B and that there's this gray area in between. Like I'm no expert on transitioning, but I know that I'm not looking to continually say no to change. Mm -hmm. I've seen the, the empowerment that comes with going through the uncomfortable growth that comes with shifting and pushing through change. I don't want to go back to the person that would always hang back when an opportunity might arise. I want to be a little more proactive in embracing the opportunities versus the safety of waiting and seeing. 
So when you think about that beginning phase. Beginning new or? No, the, the ending. Yep. Is it helpful for you to think about that as an ending or letting go? Does that add more to the concern about change? Or is it, I mean, there's part of me where ending and letting go feels so final. Yeah, I can see that. That's why I'm like, I'm not sure because I'm not sure how I feel about it. The way you just phrased that is helpful. Understanding that for for something new to start, maybe something else has to end. I feel more comfortable with that than maybe I ever have been. Five or 10 years ago, I would probably feel a lot of angst with stopping something that I know. Now I'm more of like, well, I'm transitioning away from something I know because there's something new that has a lot of potential to serve me better. Knowing that, like that's the real reason I'm I'm going to be changing is because it's going to be better. There's no sense in changing something if it's working, unless you have a different view on that. But like, that's not always in your control, I guess. But that's kind yeah. of one of those things when I talk about journaling and I'm talking about, okay, what's my environment like? The things that are out of my control. Also being aware like, well, this is out of my control. And so that thing is ending and I can't do anything to stop it, right? Like they don't make this certain product anymore or they don't mm-hmm. offer this anymore. Well, I can't, I can't change that. Right. So instead of sitting in the emotion of being upset that something's changing that I can't control, asking myself questions or being more curious about why I'm reacting the way I'm reacting, I guess, I mean, that fits my personality. I'm very introspective. (laughs) I think you've told me before. You are. But for how introspective I am, it's like, well, maybe I can turn that on myself and help myself work through something that's difficult, like a a difficult change. Mm -hmm. Of course, this might all be in theory. Like you might have like 10 examples on on the top of your head of where you're like, oh no, Keith, you really don't like it when, (laughs) when something's coming to an end and you have to embrace transition, you know, I think it's a little easier sometimes to see how somebody else is going through a situation versus me reporting on myself. Yeah, that's a good point. Sometimes we aren't always our best. Which is why it's really nice to have a partner. Yeah. You know, or confidant or or somebody that you Mm -hmm. can. That partner. Exactly. Confidant. I like confidant. While you were thinking about ending something so that something new can start, it felt almost like a resistance or a hesitancy or how the weight of that you mentioned. Right. Can you elaborate a little more? I think the uncertainty of moving into the neutral zone or moving into that place where you're needing to figure out how to let go and figuring out what is next, there is just this sense of uncertainty, I think, to it. It's like standing on the edge of a diving board. A little bit. The 10-foot high diving board kind of thing. Yeah, actually, that's a really good You got to, like, when are you going to leap? When I I was little, I I love that analogy because you remember that. I sense a story coming out. I know, I know. (laughs) The pool where I grew up was outside. It's freezing cold. The locker rooms just had that smell of, like, chlorine and wet. There was a small diving board, and there was, was it 10 foot? It must have been. I don't know. It was the high board and you climb the stairs and you get up there and it was so much taller than I remember it looking like it was when I was on the ground. Oh yeah. The lifeguard would sit there with kind of a pole (laughs) because. And a poking stick. (laughs) Well, kind of. I mean, not, no, not, not to poke you off. Actually, that probably would have been helpful to just be like, get going. Um, But I remember standing up there. I don't think I did it many times, but I remember climbing up and the higher it got, and I was a pretty good swimmer, but I remember it felt like everyone was looking. Everyone was like, oh, she's going to fall on her stomach and do a big old belly flop. All I could think is, how cold is the water? I have no idea if I'm going to touch the bottom, if I'm going to fall on my butt, if I'm going to get the wind knocked out of me. There's all of those things that were just terrifying about this 
high diving board. And like I said, I only did it once or twice. I don't even know why I did it. It must have had to had to do with something like you could then be in the deep end or you there must have been something attached to it. Okay. Interesting. Right. Because I don't think I'd be like, oh, I'm a daredevil. I'm going to go up there and just do it. Like, I think there was something, either you had to do it for swim lessons. It was like your final thing. Or to do it, then you could be in the deep end. So you're saying it was a requirement for something that your achiever brain probably wanted to achieve. Probably. Interesting. Probably. Okay. But I remember doing it. I remember the lifeguard having the hook out there so you could grab it. And they could pull you up. You're right. It This... Change is kind of like that. You're sitting on the edge of that diving board. And once you step off, gravity does its thing. And it takes you and pulls you through that. The thing that you're scared and worried and uncertain about. To then that lifeguard really taking that hook and helping you get back to the surface. Mm -hmm. That's kind of an interesting. I haven't remembered that for a long time. Hmm. So do you remember anything about the feeling after you jumped? I was relieved. I do remember being like, I was right. The water was really cold that I was about as graceful, actually, as I thought I would be, which was not a lot. (laughs) Probably flailing arms and limbs, right? And a scream, you know, with my spiral perm floating behind me. (laughs) (laughs) But I I remember those things. So I think there was relief. I think, uh, okay, I did it. I'm, I am now a person who has jumped off the diving board. There you go, yeah. But I don't know if I felt a whole lot different. But it was a change. Yeah. Right? I went from being someone that was only in the shallow end, being able to pass my swim lesson. Yeah. That jumping off into the uncertain, that metaphor, right, of the diving right. board, I mean, that's what we've been talking about for months and years probably with each other, getting comfortable being uncomfortable leads to possibility. Like you might have found that you really enjoyed that feeling and wanted to try again to see if you could do better, right? Right. Like there's possibility there. Sounds like what you found out was like, yeah, that was about as fun as I thought. Uh, At least I did it. I'm going to try not to do that again, (laughs) right? Yeah. That's an okay outcome too. Yeah. I I think the question that people ask want answered or her, or ask or I try to ask myself is so how do I put myself in those situations where I can continue to leap I mean how do you get the courage to walk up that stair to the the high dive yeah I mean because because for me that's where the patience comes in like I've heard people say like pick a goal that is so boring that if you told somebody about it they would laugh at you mm. and do that and you build momentum and then in slowly in, you increase and increase and you don't have to feel all this pressure that I have to do the best and the most. All these thoughts that we tell ourselves, you can start small. And if you start small now, like we've talked about this, starting small yeah. now gets you further along than waiting and waiting and waiting for the right conditions, waiting for the pool to heat up to 83 degrees, mm-hmm. stopping the excuses and just creating the conditions for you to succeed no matter how small builds momentum i think so i i'm just wondering if you have any other thoughts about that because that's like what i think and and what i'm i'm trying to hold on to to help propel myself forward and to to set myself up to to keep jumping off of a a ledge that's a little higher than is comfortable small wins persistence consistency this is all building towards something that's like what i try to repeat to myself as i build things as i'm working towards more or better perhaps What's most important is that we understand where it is we're headed and want to go and have that be something that's compelling. Have that be a problem that we are interested in solving. Have the topic that we're growing and changing for be something that we're interested in and intrigued by. We might not be excited about it, but maybe intrigued because there are so many things that you may not decide to go through the change for because at the end of the day, that new beginning isn't necessarily something that you're interested in. Being able to see the future state, being able to see what a new beginning or new state looks like 
and whether or not that's something you are interested in uh, striving for, striving for, I think is helpful. So you're saying that having a goal to achieve in mind that is appealing will help you move forward towards achieving that goal. Correct. I I could completely agree with that. (laughs) Because, because if there's not, if it's not like if jumping off the, the high dive does not interest you, what's the point? Right. Or, or, um, if the goal of, I want to ski a black diamond does not interest me, perhaps I don't need to figure out how to move through that change process to become a skier, a downhill skier. Right. So why would anybody try something that they're not interested in? Like pressure? Outside pressure? Yeah, I think outside pressure. Mm. And so maybe I'm going to take back some of what I said. You might try something you're not interested in because you aren't sure whether or not you know enough about whether to make that decision yet about your interest level. The thing about that that is intriguing to me is trying something and finding out you don't like it is I think almost as or just as important as finding out you like it. The thing I said to you the other night, I'm like, I I don't know if the outcome matters with some things. The point is more that I did it. I did the thing that gave me an outcome. Right. I guess an extension of that is it's very informative to know that I like the result or I don't like the result. Okay. Both things are very informative. So give me an example. Trying some food that I don't know if I'm going to like. Trying it and not liking it lets me know like, oh, I don't like that. Trying it and liking it. Oh, I like that. Cool. Now I have another option. I really don't like mushrooms. But when I see them sometimes prepared, I'm like, I kind of want to try that. And I kind of regret trying it because I don't like it. it I, it's a it's total texture thing for me. I'm sure I'll find some that I like someday. It's more for me, hun. Yep, exactly. You can have all you want. But like the Brazilian restaurant on our honeymoon or something. Sure. That's maybe when I, I realized I like black beans. Oh, yeah. There's... You know, I've never had them before. Yeah. And you can go through your life saying, I don't like that because you've never had it. Or you can try it and know for sure. That right now I don't like that or right now I do like that. And your taste can change, but yeah, I think it's more, I think it's very important to actually do the thing within reason, obviously within like safety and stuff. How I, like how I was talking about uh, small wins and how that builds momentum. And then all of a sudden before you know it, you're, you're tackling bigger problems or bigger things trying some food that I don't think I'm going to like, or maybe won't like. I think the most important thing is trying it over whether I like it or not. Yeah. And that's pretty low stakes thing. Like the scalp ceviche or whatever. I tried a little bit of it. You did. I was pretty sure I wasn't going to like it, but I tried it because I'm like, well, you know what? Maybe I will really like this. I didn't. I think the most important thing of that is I, I at least I tried it. Yeah. I mean, that, and that's low stakes too. Right. But building that muscle with things that are low stakes, I think will serve you when things get to be a little more higher stakes. That your decision could really shift the trajectory of your life. Moving somewhere or taking a new job. Those are pretty big shifts or can be pretty big shifts depending on your circumstances. Right. You've been talking about some of the things that we can do kind of day to day, give things a shot, figure out if you like them, things like that. I think it is good to do that because sometimes you don't have an option when change presents itself. You can tell like I'm a bit of a control freak. I I keep talking about the things that I think I can control and I can choose. (laughs) And I know there are things out of my control, but I tend to forget about it and I don't address it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that's the thing I kind of wanted to dig into. We're kind of going about, although things are scary, we have agency. And I always believe we have agency in these processes, right? Yeah, there's, there's always a choice, even if it doesn't feel like there is one. It's just usually that you don't like either choice. Right. And so I guess what I'm struggling with right now is I'm thinking not everyone 
feels like they have that agency when they're going through being faced with with the change that's coming, whether they like it or not. Yeah, so it's a hard ending, right? Right, a hard ending, having to shift or not, and thinking about it from the perspective of working with people that are going through a change that they didn't ask for, didn't want, don't deserve, aren't keen on, <laughs> and maybe don't deserve. I mean, thinking about this in those three phases. I still think it's helpful to think if people aren't on board and they're grumpy and pushing back and they're disengaged, okay, right now people are going through that phase where they're having a sense of loss and they may not recognize that, but even to say, okay, right now they feel like they're losing something. There's an ending and maybe they themselves aren't quite sure if or how to let go. And you probably see that in me too. And I might see that in you. I don't have good examples or anything like that. Where you just see, okay, there's change. But Laura's, like she's having a real sense of loss right now about this. And she's not seeing that path. How do we keep moving towards the edge of the diving board and get ready to jump? You know, it's, it's how do you support people through that? Because I know when there's a change that's coming from me, that... I don't want to happen. I like current state. You be like, it's okay, just go. I guess what I'm trying to say is sometimes no amount of cheerleading or supportive conversations can help people work through that loss. Sometimes they need to work through it in their own way, on their own timetable. And that's hard. Yeah. Equipping yourself with the tools to support another and yourself I don't think that can be overstated. Being able to talk about what you just said is because you have tools and that you, you've you sought out ways to talk about hard things. Being able to work with somebody that's having a hard time, being able to ask them questions without being overbearing. Hey, what do you need? This is hard. What you're going through, I, I'm not 100% sure what you're dealing with. Do you want to talk about it? Things like that, the, the, having the awareness of you're not there to fix it. You're there to yeah. support, you know, and sometimes that just means that there's nothing you can do except for to say, I'm here, but I don't know what to do either. I mean, sometimes like if something's really hard, sometimes people don't want to talk about it. Like maybe you're in a little bit of denial right now and that's okay. Yeah. Right. Like, can we just ignore that right now? I want to go watch a movie with you. Yeah. You Again, looking out for the, the health and safety of yourself and others with all of this, right? Like I'm not, I'm not qualified <laughs> for any of this. I just know, I know what it feels like to simply need to sit next to somebody. And I know you definitely know that you don't need me to constantly give you advice on how to fix a problem. Yeah. Sometimes you simply need me to listen. Right. And then... We can go and sit on the deck and have some lemonade or something, you know, like, or whatever beverage you feel like at that, that <laughs> night, you know? Yeah. I don't think that can be overstated. Like it might sound like it's not enough, but sometimes that's all there is, is to simply have somebody witness what you're going through. Yep. Yeah. You said something important about not trying to fix something and still hard for me <laughs> i know it is i've been i've been listening to the book super communicators the one thing they've been talking about is how important it is to really understand what type of conversation you're having and what people want from that conversation so what is it really about is it about trying to help get advice or make a decision so I think that's something you and I have worked through quite a bit. I'll often say I'm not looking for advice or to fix it. So that's one of the types of conversations. Another is really more about how do you feel? What is your emotional mindset? And so that's often where I need you more because I want you to be there for me and hear me and see me and empathize and sympathize, right? And so it's that how do we feel type conversation. And then the third of the three types is who are we? 
how do others see ourselves? How do we see ourselves? Those important things, right? What is it about? So that decision-making advice, how do we feel that emotional connection, being there for someone? And who are we? How do we interact? And people interact with us. Understanding as you're working through, if we're talking about change and working through that process with people, knowing what it is that those individuals need. Because I can tell you right now, when it comes to change, rarely do I need help with the decision and advice and fixing it. Rarely do I need that, how we see ourselves, but it's mostly around that, how do I feel about it? What I'm thinking, let me, let me know how this sounds. The second one of like, how am I feeling or like, like what's my emotional mindset? Yep. If like, say I'm on this side and you're, you're coming to me with some, some change that you're dealing with, acknowledging where your mind is at and you feel seen, I think that helps you move through that and onto the other things of making the decision that you need to make and seeing Oh, yep. This is how I'm going to show up because I'm, this is how I show up and I'm going to, this is who I am. Whereas if you, if you subvert that, that (laughs) seeing somebody and how they're being affected by the situation, I think it'll take longer to get to a resolution maybe, or to the next step of the phase. And going back to the idea of a chrysalis of a monarch butterfly, it goes from green, like this really beautiful emerald kind of green. Think of it more of a jade. Yeah, jade. (laughs) You're right. It is more jade. You're right. (laughs) I'm just teasing you. You're right. You don't always know how long the butterfly is going to stay in there, but you start seeing it going from being this beautiful jade color with these intricate gold dots to kind of starting to become more and more clear. You can kind of start to see the wings of the butterfly. And then one day the butterfly is just out. And so if I think about that with the neutral zone, that phase can sometimes feel like a a state of inaction, no movement or stalling, but it really is a stage of immense change and shifting from what was to what is going to be. The detail and the beauty of that phase and the protection that phase gets, I think is something that we can possibly think about a little bit more because I know for myself when I'm in the midst of going through a change. So I think what I was saying (laughs) is Sometimes when you're in the neutral phase or the neutral part of the change process, you think that you have so much inaction, right? You feel like you're stagnant and you're not moving. But something that I have been thinking about a great deal is that sometimes you need to take that time for the future state to be what it's supposed to be. Realize that kind of that protection, that there's beauty in that. Having grace with yourself, being able to set aside that time to grow and move forward and realign yourself for where you're headed, that can be critical. The caterpillar, right, all of a sudden it's in a cocoon or chrysalis. It's encapsulated, right? And you can't really see quite what's going on. Right. Comparing that to this phase where it feels like we're really not making any progress maybe feel a little stuck. It seems like that caterpillar is in there for so long doing nothing, but there is so (laughs) much going on, so much work happening, so much transitioning. It might not feel like it. And then, like you said, and then all of a sudden there's a butterfly the next morning. I always think of every overnight success takes eight years. Not a lot of people saw all that work that went into that overnight success. Right. You don't really see all that work that goes into getting this monarch butterfly. But if you are in your own cocoon, you know that you're doing a lot of work and don't sell yourself short that these things that maybe feel small, tiny little steps, they're building to something bigger and more beautiful. Don't lose sight of like that, that trajectory you're on, that aim that you sought out and this change that you're going through that you picked it for a reason or it picked you, but there's, and there's going to be some work to get through it, but you're going to get to that end point. 
and you're going to be different for it. Yeah. And that's just, that's just where my, where my head goes. And it's probably more clear to people listening or you like, Oh yeah, Keith definitely needs to consistently show up and make some progress. It helps build the momentum for him. You know, I've said it probably 10 times today. I have a hard time taking note of the progress I've made. And then all of a sudden I'm at the end of something. Hey, let's celebrate some wins, huh? I need to keep doing that because I tend to go from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. And I want to be a little more mindful of what I did and what it took to get here and maybe acknowledge it a little bit. And maybe that'll help me push through the next thing because I've done it before. That's right. People like me, we're persistent and we're going to consistently find a way to get the work done to get to the next next stage. I appreciate that you are trying to bring up that you have to be persistent and keep going and keep pushing. Right. Well, I mean, another thing too, is I'm saying you need to, you need to, well, the conditions might be persistent and you know, like, like we don't know what's going on inside the cocoon or what's making that change happen. So I guess I I just want to be mindful. I want to give a little more attention to the fact that I'm always thinking of how I can affect things. And a lot of times the forces might be external and they're going to maybe persist upon me and, and I need to work through that or with it. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. It is important to remind yourself to be consistent and persistent. And at the same time, realize that what happens in your cocoon or in that neutral zone cocoon period doesn't always have an explanation behind it. Things sometimes take shape and shift in a way that you may not even realize. I think the habits of being consistent and persistent are important. But that growth, that change, I don't think necessarily just happens from being consistent and persistent. But I think there's something that is almost hard to put your finger on when you're moving through this transitional time yeah yeah it's i think i'm trying to say a little more like what you were just saying is how can i set myself up for the best possible outcome yeah for me that means in a case where maybe things are happening that are out of my control i'm going to be the kind of person that acknowledges that that's possible and i'm going to make the best choice and the best decision i can with the situation i'm in i'm going to show up and i'm going to respond and react in these certain ways because this is the kind of person I want to be. Right. The situation might be making that really hard, but that's why I'll check in with myself, you know, like with journaling or with you. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Okay. Cool. Is there anything else? So I guess I just want to check in with you. We've talked at length about change, about that sense of loss, and endings, that neutral kind of metamorphosis phase, and the new beginning part. Thinking about and framing it that way, do you have any different feelings about change, or are you still kind of like, no, thank you? I was kind of joking about I know you that were. when I say that. Well, it depends on what it is. Yeah. Depends on, like I said, it depends <laughs> on if I'm being surprised or delighted. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that I'm feeling is a sense of, I feel a little more at ease with things ending a little more confident with working through that in between that uncertainty and maybe a little more curious and optimistic about something new starting that cycle. I've always been a little hesitant with all aspects of that cycle. (laughs) And I, I think I've, I've grown even just talking with you about it in that way. I'll have to check out that book for sure. It helps it feel doable working through that cycle. I'm thinking of it as a cycle, just like the, yeah, the, <laughs> the butterfly, right? Like, right. Yeah. Optimistic maybe. Yeah. How about you? I'm feeling pretty good about it. I mean, like I said, I have some change that emerged last week mm-hmm. <laughs> for me. Out of your control. Out of my control. And right now I'm just working through some of that neutral zone. We didn't talk a lot about the new beginnings and the hope and the promise that that can bring. I know new beginnings or a new state can be different 
and uncertain and scary. Just like the pool, it can be cold Mm -hmm. and deep and you might belly flop Mm. on your way in. But the future state, the new beginning can be delightful, can be exciting and good. You don't always have to force yourself to see the good. Just knowing that the possibility can bring about something that is positive or helpful or beneficial helps me get through change. Even though that isn't a guarantee, I do want to believe that it is possible. It sounds like we're both trying to be optimistic. I like that. We want to believe that there's a beautiful butterfly (laughs) on the other side. Sounds good. How about for recommendations, you tell everybody uh, the books that you brought up today, and then we'll get out of here. Sounds good. One of the books I brought up today is called Super Communicators, How to Unlock the Secret Language of Connection by Charles Duhigg. Also would recommend Managing Transitions, Making the Most of Change by William Bridges and Susan Bridges. A good book on helping teams navigate change and really frame it in a way to help you have uh, productive relationships and movement through the change process. Awesome. Let's get out of here. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Uh, but the neutral zone is really the time when you're repatter- repatterning. When you're repatterning. <laughs> I can't say it. You say it. Can you say it? <laughs>